Hello, I'm Mark Bremer, and in this 11th movie in this tutorial series of Poser 10 and Poser Pro 2014, we are going to begin looking at rendering. I'm actually going to divide this into two movies because it's a fairly complex subject, or it can be complex. In this first movie, this one right here, we'll be looking at realistic rendering and considerations when you do that. The rendering is different than many other components in Poser because it actually combines a lot of the other features of Poser. It is how lighting interacts and materials, items like that, and camera settings all come together and get distilled by the render engine. And you can create renders that will never complete in your lifetime if you check all the boxes available. So I want to have kind of an intelligent review of what those mean and how you can go ahead and begin working with your, your scenes and take your renders up to the next level. The first thing I want you to do is to pop over to the preferences, open that up, come over to the render tab and make sure that you have the maximum number of render processes set up right here. The reason you want to do that is that it speeds up rendering. Right now mine says 32 which is the max I can do on my system. Yours may be more or less depending on your hardware. There's a little checkbox for separate processes and I typically leave that unchecked but there's times you might want to turn that on. When? It's when you're doing a final render that may take place over a lunch hour, overnight, something like that, or that you're going to walk away from the system and let it do its own thing for a little bit. You have to validate each process and for the sake of this tutorial you don't want me clicking OK, OK, OK for some of these other processes that go on. It is a little more efficient but uh, that front end is a pain especially when you're doing renders over and over again which we're doing. The max cache renders, I usually leave at 25. This is how many renders the Poser program will keep in its system before it dumps them to make room for a new one. And then texture caching. This is a big one. If you work with imported scenes, like ones that Stonemason makes or Dreamcatcher, um, I should say Dream Worlds, those are very rich texture-based materials and you might want to bump up your caching in uh, Poser just so that your system doesn't have to reanalyze them all the time. The more it can load into the cache if you've got the ability for that the better it is for you so you don't have to wait around. So I'll simply click OK here. We happen to have our favorite Poser character Andy sitting in, uh, well he's in the studio with a bunch of daffodils. This is the stock lighting that is built into the scene when you load it up and it's the stock materials on Andy and then I've got some plants I've come across uh, by and by. The reason I want to do this is that each one of these materials and the spacing of the items is different so we're going to be able to play with depth of field and things like that and look how we can improve those settings with the render settings as well. When I talk about the render engine having to kind of distill everything else you've done inside of Poser, including animation if you're doing that. Andy's a perfect case right here. The material for him is uh, translucent. It allows light to go through it partly and it kind of illuminates areas like a glass of milk when sunlight hits that or something. The flowers have a little bit of that going on too, but it's a little bit different and we'll start playing with settings to work with that. Now what I like to do when we get into render settings and I'm moving cameras around and doing things like that is use a little function we haven't looked at or dealt with before and that is a new window. You can come down to Ray Trace Preview. This pops into your scene and whenever you're done doing something if you turn on auto refresh it will update. If you don't turn on auto refresh you can do it manually and then see exactly how your scene is going to render out. So if we come back to the preview area and I make any change to anything, this will go ahead and update. If I click refresh right now, we'll get a dynamic view of what's going on. You can go ahead if you want and port this into another window by clicking and dragging it over there or you can leave it free floating like I've got going right now as we go back and forth in the scene. Okay, let's take a look at some of the options where they are inside of render. You may have explored some of these. You've probably played with the area render where you've got just a small section that keeps re-rendering over and over again. Um, we're kind of uh, taking care of that with the ray trace preview so we don't have to do that. Render and background is of just like it sounds and we're not going to go through all these. They're pretty self-explanatory. We'll come up and deal with sketch renderer later but anti-aliasing the document if we click on that, we'll see that the edges will smooth out and gives us a more realistic view of our scene if we want to do that. We also have the ability to motion blur the document. This won't do a thing unless you've got animation set into your scene. Now you might want something in your scene blurred because of motion, 
for a still image. You will have to go ahead and animate that and then let the program know by engaging the motion blur. What we'll take a look at here is render dimensions and render settings. By default, Poser always renders to the window that the camera is in unless you go ahead and come up here to render and select render dimensions. Right here we just say match preview window. I'm going to stick with that for this tutorial, but if you want to go ahead and get something to a set size for a desktop or something like that, if you're rendering to print, this is where you go ahead and set that and set the resolution and all those items there that would go with it. By default, the, the resolution is typically 72. Some monitors have 96 pixels per inch, that type of thing. So I'll let you play with that, but know that that's where that is located. Okay, let's pop open the render window and start getting into the details here. Whoops, before I do that, well, let me get out of here and then we'll come back. I'll say save settings at the moment. We've got an option down here to reload textures if we've made a change, but there's something really important to reuse shadow maps. When you get to a final render setting and you're letting the render engine calculate shadow maps, if you move a camera because you want a different view after you see how it's played out or something, you can, and you haven't changed the lighting or anything, you can ask the program to reuse all the math it went through to calculate the shadows. And that's a great time saver to just accelerate uh, your render if you're not changing anything. If you move an object or if you change a light, you have to recalculate the shadow maps. But if you're not and just moving the camera, this is a huge time saver. Okay, back to render settings. Several things to note. There are movie settings in this tab and there are the render settings. We're going to be concentrating on the render settings and within the render area there is the Firefly render which is Poser's built-in photorealistic render. It does a very good job. There is the sketch tab that we'll deal with in another movie and then there's the preview settings. Now the preview is what you see in your window and you can render to it. It's a fast way to go ahead and just check things out, especially motion. If you go ahead and select this type of render engine, you can go ahead and do an animation real quickly and see exactly how the animation is working without having to take the time to calculate everything else. Just know that this option is here for that if you'd like. I will be concentrating on the Firefly render engine here and it has two capacities that are independently saved inside the program. There's manual settings and there are auto settings. You can jump back and forth between them and save different settings to these two and the program will go ahead and save them and reuse them depending on which one you have activated or highlighted right here. Now, under manual settings, which is where Firefly always opens up to, you can say acquire from auto, which means that if you come over to auto and it's just, it's really a no-brainer. It's nice to work with this. Basically, they've got a little stopwatch. The closer you get to a final quality, the longer it's going to take to render. And if you just drag this little thing over here and do a render like this, you'll see other options automatically engage, like ray tracing and items like that. There are other things to consider right here for your rendering. One is depth of field. This requires playing with a camera. You don't have to be in the final setting to work with depth of field. You can engage that independently if you want to and then work with it. Let's do that right now and that will help explain some of these other settings as we get into them here when we work with our render. I'll say save settings right now. We'll notice that well our little scene hasn't updated right here. I need to go ahead and click refresh if I want to and now it looks fuzzy. We've engaged up the field and the way you manage that is actually with the camera. So let's see if I can tuck this in here if it'll let me put it there. There we go. I'm going to take my scene and pull this up just a little bit. You can always drag this out as we've learned in another movie if you want to do that. Okay, main camera. I'm going to convert this space right here in the preview to a four window version. This will help us understand what's going on with the camera itself. We're looking through the main camera right here and what I want to do is select the camera. So I'm going to come up here, cameras, come down to main and we get some options to work with for our camera itself. Focal point, or the focal characteristics of the camera, are preset at 75 millimeter. If you're f not familiar with, um, I should say, cameras that much, you can think of a 50 millimeter or 75 millimeter camera as a portrait camera. Uh, 
it allows for very nice presentations without that weird fisheye type of thing. You know, when people get their camera phones too close to their dog and the nose looks huge, that's because those are actually set to about 35 or 25 millimeter types of lens or focal points in the camera. So what I'm going to do is actually click on this and change it to 35, like a 35 millimeter camera. It changes my scene because the way the lens is set up, it um, captures more of what's around you, which is like camera phones. They've got this little lens that fish eyes it out. So once that takes place, what I would have to do, let me go ahead and scroll, is transform and zoom my camera in a little bit. So on the dolly Z axis, I can go ahead and bring this in a little bit and get closer to where our scene looks like it did in the first place. We'll see our window dynamically update right here. Now this is a square presentation as opposed to a letterbox presentation, so know that that's going on. The next thing I want to take a look at now is the actual perspective on the camera. If you leave this just the way it is, this is... um. Oh, it kind of flattens out the picture. You know how you get a fisheye look, and if you take a picture of a straight line, but it's at the edge of the frame, it warps a little bit? This perspective dial will flatten some of that out. What we will concentrate on right here is the focal distance, or focus distance. I'm going to click and drag, and as I do that, we'll see this little um, strange box with uh, a circle in the middle, which is actually where your camera is pointed dead on and then there's a black line next to it and that is the focal plane. So what I'm going to do is have this focal plane and by plane I mean where this black line cuts through the, your scene or your object is exactly where the focus is going to be. So I'm going to release it right here. We can see that the focal distance is about 15. We'll come down to something else called the f-stop. This I won't get into big, big conversations about this, but just know that the smaller this is, the fuzzier the depth of field becomes. So what I'll do is, well, let me take this down to something like 1. Our scene updates, and we can tell here that we're getting a blur going on with the daffodils that are near us, but everything looks like it's sharper as it goes back. That's exactly what we want, and this is why we use this ray trace preview to see this. Now, if we do a quick render into our scene right here, come up to Render. We'll let it do its thing. It's calculating the subsurface scattering for Andy. And then we see everything show up here. Now, for the sake of this tutorial right now, you may not be able to see, but this is a really, really grainy defocus. And there's a way to clean that up. This is why I wanted to set this up so we can get some common sense usage out of some of the render settings. Let's come up to render. We'll come down to render settings. The quality of the blur, whether it is a depth of field blur or whether it's a motion blur, is controlled by the post filter size. So the higher you crank this thing, the better the results are in the actual blurring that takes place, the less grainy it is as you work with that. If I say render now to Firefly, I'll go ahead and kick in here and do its thing all over again. And at least for me, it looks a lot better right here. This is something where if you've got high contrast edges next to each other, it becomes really obvious, like a, the interior of a building or something like that. You'll notice that our character is out of focus right here and I can't tell you why. Let's go ahead and pop into our preview area here and see if we can figure that out. We've got a 35 millimeter setting and it may be because I've got the aperture so small on that or the f-stop I mean. Let me go ahead and double check with our focal distance. I'll click and move that. That's looking okay. Let me go ahead and change our f-stop now to something more like 5 and click OK. When we do a render again, it'll go through its thing right here, and you'll notice there's no shadows of Andy being calculated right now. That's because we're still in the low resolution area here. We haven't increased the settings to a final render. Now we can see the daffodil is not quite as blurry. Andy's a little bit blurry, and this is where you go back and forth tweaking with your ray trace preview and some of the settings. It is smart to go ahead and do a lot of your fine-tuning of your render settings at this lower draft mode resolution.
If we go ahead and increase this to final, and again, these settings are different than the manual settings, although they are there are similarities to it. If I click render now, it'll do its thing again, but it starts thinking just a little bit more about it. It's calculating shadows and all that good stuff. And we see that, well, Andy's still a little bit blurry, so we get to go in and play with this. There it finishes off, so we get some nice uh, visual location of where things are in the scene based on the shadows. Let's examine some of these settings just a little bit more. If we wanted to engage 3D motion blur, we can simply enable the checkbox. We've got a very high fidelity render going on here, but we don't have all the, the bells and whistles. Know that every time you click a box, it's going to take longer to calculate and render. And in fact, if you decide just to see what Tune Render is, you may want to turn off some of these other items because it uh, hides a lot of things that pop into the shadow. And we'll deal with that more when we get into the non-photorealistic rendering as we go through that. Post filter type here, we can go ahead when it comes to blurring, we can go ahead and let the program know how we want it to calculate the blurs. These all give very different feelings to it. A box is most common, and one of the reasons that's selected is it kind of imitates uh, camera behaviors, but Gaussian Blur does some absolutely cool stuff. We're not going to sit here and just play so you can have, you know, watch me render. But I want you to know that that's there, and it's worth checking out, as is uh, sign C. We can go ahead and do some HDR optimized output if you're going to be exporting any of these scenes to be used as an HDRI probe or something like that, which is actually more of an advanced technique that we haven't gotten into just yet. But let's compare auto settings to manual settings. With manual settings selected, everything I did in auto settings is still over there, but the program now with this little radio button checked is going to render based upon what it sees right here. So if I wanted to, I could dial some of these things down, but first let's explain what some of these things are. The auto settings are shortcuts and uh, you can simply acquire from settings uh, from auto if you wanted but let me explain a little bit more of what these do these all make sense right here but subsurface scattering if we want this render to speed up a little bit with the settings we can turn that off right now the result is that Andy's not going to look like a glass of milk anymore the, the lights going to hit him and stop he's going to be dark on the dark side and there'll be no light transmission going through the geometry that's Andy Subsurface scattering takes longer, but it gives a great look. It also is important for human skin. Ray trace bounces. As the program does its thing, and you're making it look like it's more realistic, let me go ahead and move this out of the way a little bit. The ray trace bounces are a way to disperse color in the scene realistically. And what I mean by that is when light comes in from the spotlight and hits Andy, you expect or your eye expects to see some of the color of Andy on the area around him. Just like if we had a red ball on the scene, you would expect the area around the ball to be a little bit red just because the light is bouncing and reflecting off of that. Ray tracing and then how many bounces the ray has is how you adjust that. If we increase this to something like four, it's going to calculate each light ray out of the lights in the scene and then follow it around the scene as it bounces from one object to another. For fidelity of textures, we can increase the pixel samples, which is a good way to go ahead and save time rendering when you're doing kind of draft renders, but when you get ready for a final, this is actually getting cranked up. The max bucket size is how big the little squares are when it renders. Let me go ahead and say render now. We've made a couple little changes. It's going to take a little bit longer to calculate, but not much and it's now the squares that you see as the scene gets rendered if I had a dark background it'd be a little bit easier to see why would you want to change that if you've got a scene with a bunch of fine fine detail in it a smaller bucket size will more efficiently use all the processors you have in your computer if your scene is very simple when you come up here you can go ahead and increase the bucket size to something like 64, 128. It doesn't have to be multiples of 32, but that does work pretty well if you do that. Progressive mode also is another way, especially if you kind of like to get an idea of what's going on. Instead of waiting for each bucket to do its complete render, what this will do is go ahead and uh, 
do it like you see it as they res up um, images in spy movies when they capture something on a camera and go, well, the computer can figure out who this blurry image is. Huge lie. But that's what Progressive actually does right here. It incrementally increases the resolution of the render until it is finally all done. Now look what's going on with the render time. Taking a while because it's progressively improving each time it's making a pass in the scene. I'm going to cancel this right now. But again, this is one of those options that once you see it in action, you can kind of go, oh, well, that, I guess that makes sense. Also, over here, we can have items such as background only. Let me turn off progressive mode, which actually enables. Notice there's a little help down here. This is what turns on ray tracing, which creates the ability to get refraction through objects, light going through glass, reflection on mirrors. You have to have progressive mode turned on to make that ability take place. That's another reason that you can turn it on or off because it takes a lot longer to render that. This is a ray trace preview over here in the lower right hand side. If you've got a mirror in your scene or if you've got um, glasses on a table and you want the light to come through and do kind of cool stuff with caustics on that, the ray trace has to be on. You can see what's going on with the ray trace preview, but your render is going to require you to turn on this progressive mode to engage that feature. If you've got low res uh, items in your scene, you can engage smooth polygons, which actually does something called putting a fong tag on the geometry and smooths it out so you don't see these little squares across the object. All of these are pretty I should say um, common sense. One that may not be is remove back facing polys. And this allows you to go ahead and call geometry from the scene. The program will analyze your scene and go, you know what, I can't see this one object because it's behind another. I'm going to forget about it and not calculate lighting for it. There are times you might not want to turn that on that has to do with uh, transparent objects and things like that, but it's all for some good experimentation there. If I turn this to Gaussian and we engage that, we'll get a slightly different render here. But I do want to say we've got um, presets we can create. We can load some. If they're saved, we can go ahead and save presets out of here and name them if we would like to. So that is the, the basics right here. If I acquire my manual settings from the auto settings, and we just click on this tab, we'll see everything automatically get um, realigned over in here. Not everything changes, but th some things do. Again, the progressive mode is going to be your highest fidelity rendering. So with these render settings right here, just a final render, and I could go in and play with the camera a little bit um, more if I wanted to. Just restored the defaults for that. But we'll go ahead and render this out. That's kind of an introduction to realistic rendering. Now, what have I not covered about realistic rendering here? Quite a little bit how we play with image-based lighting, how we go ahead and selectively choose to have lights cast shadows or not cast shadows within a scene, how we deploy textures into the scene so that the render engine can take, or I should say, take some shortcuts when it's considering textures that are further away called mip mapping, things like that. That all gets tied into this, but there is your quick tour into the basics of getting photorealistic renders and improving special effects like motion blur and camera blurs when working inside of Poser.